Uh, Signe Arneson, who is here with me today. Signe is the director of Cybertip.ca. Uh, I believe that she'll be able to answer some of the questions you have much more, uh, with much more background than I have. This is going to be a difficult release. It's, uh, I'll tell you, it was difficult to prep for me, and I'm sure it's going to be difficult for, uh, for everyone to hear. Investigators with the Winnipeg Police Service Internet Child Exploitation Unit, ICE, have made an arrest in a cross-border investigation of child sexual abuse imagery. Greg Allen Jamison, 45 years of Winnipeg, has been charged with the following offenses. Make child pornography, sexual interference, agreement or arrangement, sexual offense against a child, child exploitation, an agreement or arrangement, sexual offense against a child, make child pornography. Jamison was arrested March 27th as a result of a lengthy investigation. In mid-2016, ICE investigators were contacted by the National Center for Missing Exploited Children regarding sexual abuse images from a Winnipeg-based IP address. In November 2016, an initial investigation of a Winnipeg residence revealed the presence of child sexual abuse images involving victims as young as eight months old. As a result, Jamison was arrested at that time and charged with possession and making available child pornography. He was initially detained in custody. However, he was subsequently granted bail. ICE investigators continue with their investigation, which revealed a communication was established via a popular instant messaging live streaming app with an as of yet unidentified male, uh, male suspect located in the United States. This suspect was live streaming the sexual assault of a six-year-old child in his care. The investi the investigation indicated that the American suspect was being directed to commit various sexual assaults against this child by an individual in Winnipeg. As a result, on March 2nd, the above noted charges were laid against Jameson, who was detained in custody. I believe that should be March 22nd. Efforts to determine the exact location and identity of the victim were continuing with the assist are continuing with the assistance of the National Child Exploitation Coordination Center as well as the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Additional information on internet child exploitation can be found at cybertip.ca, which is owned and operated by the Canadian Center for Child Exploitation. Um, I, maybe I'll take your questions first about this specific case, and uh, more general questions can be directed to Sydney Arneson. You're welcome to join me at the podium. Questions? For either of us. Well, it starts off, I think, like many, um, like many ICE investigations, where um, one of the uh, one of the aggregators of information. In this case, it was the um, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, provides information on a very regular basis, daily basis, to our investigators, which which would initiate an actual criminal investigation. So, um, maybe, do you want to talk a bit about how that information is is acquired and then sent? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially the U.S. counterpart to cybertip.ca here in Canada. So they're an NGO, they take in reports from the public, and then if it involves something related to a Canadian location, they would be actioning that information in. So, I mean, the tipsters come from a variety of different uh, places, but hotlines or tip lines are uh, certainly one of the ones that submit information into child exploitation units. Um, what more can you say about... Uh what can we know more about? I mean, we see over here what his offenses were. What further details can we have at this point? You know, typically, uh, and, and I don't think this case is going to be much different, we don't release a lot of details on an individual who's charged. Uh, our obligation from a law enforcement standpoint is to indicate the name, which is now public. It's a public document the, that the charges have been laid, uh, and that uh, the individual was a resident, in this case a resident of Winnipeg. That's as far as we would usually go. I can tell you that uh, from my briefing on this case that prior to this investigation, uh, the individual was not on our radar. I don't think we had police contact. I don't know if I can tell you a lot more, probably nothing more about the individual itself. 
I can tell you that we do have some investigators here. They're not uh, uh, they're, they're not here really for uh, for media interview, but um, I had indicated well, once before in a release that, that, that I, I believe from my own understanding of this as well as talking to these investigators that it's some of the most difficult investigations that not only Winnipeg Police Service does but law enforcement anywhere does. Um, a huge dedication in terms of uh, uh, the work and the training that these individuals go through as well as I'm sure everyone can uh, can also imagine the uh, the personal uh, uh, difficulties that would be associated <coughs> excuse me to this type of investigation. Um, it's uh, it, they're they're daunting. They're long. They're detailed. Um, they're often involving state-of-the-art uh, uh, research techniques and investigative techniques on on electronic systems. It's it, it's something I think it, it, as horrific as it is for us to have to detail the the uh, the specific specific offense here. I think it's. Uh, I think most law enforcement agencies, including Winnipeg Police Service, are incredibly proud of the people who, who step up and do this kind of work. How does it make you feel, though, to know that this is something that, like, this is from our community, this is where we live, this is what's happening. Uh, I'm sure people, when they hear this, when they, they come to us after we put these stories out there, say, like, should we be worried? Should we? I, I think both Signe and I are going to have some comment, and I'll make mine first. Okay. And, and I, I'm... So, uh, Zara, I'm glad you asked that because I, I think one of the purposes in doing a release like this is to break down that stigma that this is some odd thing that you hear about. These investigators get these tips, uh, ICE gets these tips on a daily basis and, and um, it is not uncommon. It is everywhere. It's in every community. Uh, it's certainly in Winnipeg which is why we have a team of experts who work in this. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe you can give some broader information. Yeah, I think you, you're asking something that we continue to try and put out in the media, which is this is occurring in homes and bedrooms not only within this city, within this province, within the country, and internationally. And the analysts, when they're an analyzing images, 70% of them typically involve a home setting. So someone who's able to do this type of thing to a child has access and time alone. And that's usually a, a parent or a guardian who's doing this. So I think, you know, we need a big wake-up call that whether we like it or not, there, there are individuals who have serious sexual interest in children, quite deviant in nature, obviously illegal. And uh, we have to remove this idea that somehow we can assess whether someone is safe to be around children because we like the person. Someone's character has nothing to do with that. It's their behavior around kids. And we know through the experience of the tip line as well as the child exploitation units across this country um, that we're seeing this happen at, a, at an alarming rate uh, in relation to children. So we need the word to get out there that, um, you know, this is happening directly in our communities. It's not something way off there. It could be someone you know. Um, Rob, Rob, sorry, uh, just for my clarification, um, the... American suspect was being directed by an individual in Winnipeg. Is that Jameson or is that an unknown person at this time? Um, we have to be very careful when we write a media release that we don't prejudice a court case. So it is written in a specific way to indicate that the investigation uh, led to uh, investigators to make the assumption that yes, not the assumption, but to come to the conclusion that um, an individual in Winnipeg was directing the, the uh, abuse, the assault. Based on the nature of this release, with it culminating in Jameson's arrest, that is certainly the belief and, and the conclusion that investigators have reached. But it's written be in the way it is because it's, it's not appropriate for me to, uh, to say anything that would be prejudicial to the case as it moves forward. What do we know about this child at this point? We don't know a lot of information about the child. Um, we know that we, uh, as investigators here and our counterparts in the U.S., who are, are, are actively working with, with uh, Winnipeg Police, uh, have not been able to identify either the, uh, the suspect abuser, the suspect who's doing the assaults, or the, um, or the victim at this point in time.
and that is still ongoing, which is why we're still working with UN, U.S. law enforcement, Homeland Security, to, to see if we can ultimately um, identify this child and locate them. And so it's believed this child is on, on the U.S. side? We, we, believe, we believe that the victim in this case is in the United States. Um, I, I want to talk about a couple of things that I learned when I was writing this release because um, it, it's, it's different than we typically do. One of the things you'll notice in this release is, um, you know, historically I was familiar with the term child porn. And, and I think that whole term um, in this day and age, in 2017, tends to, um, tends to whitewash and, and almost mitigate some of the things that are happening. And um, the, the wording we're using now, which is child sexual abuse imagery, I, I think conveys a more accurate um, a more accurate sense as to the horrific nature of the crimes that are entailed in these investigations. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is assault. I don't think abuse is an appropriate term here, uh, and it's assault of the worst kind. So we've changed, uh, uh, and with the help of investigators, I've been able to establish a, a different sort of dialogue, and, and I hope everyone here can understand why and, and the gravity of what we're talking about. Anything you want to add well, I just I agree. It's that's it's been an international standard that's now been adopted, so that we're not, you know, pornography, um, you know, is typically associated with adults and their willingness to participate in that. And as you can imagine, a six-year-old has no say over whether um, they these horrific things are done to them. So uh, I think it's really important that media reflects that properly in their stories. As well as the fact that that pornography is not illegal. And it, and I think it tends to, it, it, it tends to move the the discussion in the wrong direction because this is uh, this is sexual assault, uh, and and the correct terms are important. I'd also add that when the uh, in terms of just some t statistics, I mean we did an assessment back in January 2016, looking at about 44,000 unique images and videos. And 50% of what the analysts have to view, which the child exploitation team would be able to corroborate, involve either sexual assaults or extreme sexual assaults being committed against these children. So although posing, nude and posing, would constitute a criminal code offense, you can appreciate the escalated nature of the crimes that are being committed against the youngest and most vulnerable of victims. Um, and most of the imagery deals with prepubescent children. 80% involves prepubescent, and of that, uh, so that would be under 12, and of that, 63% are under 8. So we're talking about really young children. To, so uh, sadly, to hear about a six-year-old involved in a li live streaming incident isn't uncommon. Where do the live streaming, like where do those social media platforms come in as far as their involvement? With, like, do they not know that this is happening through a live stream platform? How does that all work as far as social media goes? Well, they're not, they're not monitoring their networks. They'd have to be notified of something going on, but that's a basically a direct connection between the two offenders who are perpetrating this against the child. Uh, live streaming incidents, uh, it's a, again very alarming, but we're seeing an increase that's trending upwards. In 2015-16, we had 20 reports of actual live streaming uh, situations, and this last year, 16-17, we had 50. And we are one, one small reporting entity. We're an important one for Canada, but complete, um, individuals report this to all sorts of different entities. Um, but it's a lens into the fact that this is shifting and moving and this idea of on-demand sexual abuse is something that's happening amongst the offending community. So they connect within these different forums and chat rooms where uh, individuals reinforce and collaborate and uh, have their cognitive distortions around how, how this is all okay and then they move over into Skype or some uh, live streaming function where they can be potentially executing what was occurring to this six-year-old. So you mentioned social media platforms and I, I don't believe that actually social media platforms were a key element of this particular investigation. The so live streaming could be, could be a um, FaceTime, it could be Skype, okay. it could be any number of, uh, of apps or facilities that allow that type of direct uh, live communication. Is that it? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.